In the 30 years since it hit theaters, virtually every superhero movie has been influenced by what was first accomplished in Batman 89. Its impact has been so massive that, in a world where it set the standards, you might not have even noticed how much of an effect it had. For those of you who don't remember what it was like back in the days leading up to June 23, 1989, it cannot be stressed enough that Batman was everywhere that summer. Even in a year crowded with massively successful franchise movies like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Back to the Future 2, and the beginning of the Disney renaissance with The Little Mermaid, The Dark Knight was pop culture's most inescapable character. Of course, movie marketing had existed for as long as movies had, but the Batman marketing was on a whole different level. There were countless tie-ins, from toys to breakfast cereals to a concept album by Prince, all of which arrived with some of the strongest branding ever. Rather than putting the spotlight on director Tim Burton, stars Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, or even the character of Batman himself, the marketing was overwhelmingly focused on the iconic image of Batman's emblem. It started with the first poster, which was just the emblem and a release date, and continued across countless t-shirts, hats, action figures, and pretty much everything else in the meantime. Even the opening sequence of the movie itself was just an extreme close-up of that logo underneath the credits. By reducing the entire idea of Batman down to that symbol, using the branding that had already been refined over the past 50 years of comics and pop culture, Warner Brothers seared that image into moviegoers' minds and sold an estimated $500 million in merchandise alone. Adjusting for inflation, that's over $1 billion today, all before we even get to the box office take for the movie itself. Hubba hubba hubba! Money, money, money! Who do you trust? Me? I'm giving away free money! For a movie about a character famously known for being super competent at crime fighting and having a plan for every eventuality, one of the weirdest moments of Batman 89 comes right at the beginning. The very first thing we see Batman do after he glides silently onto a rooftop to confront two criminals who have just committed a mugging is get shot and fall down. Seriously, this is our introduction to The Dark Knight, finally returning to the big screen for the first time in 23 years. To be fair, the crucial element here is that after being shot, Batman gets back up. It also showcases one of the movie's changes to Batman. His costume isn't just a costume, it's bulletproof body armor. Wait a minute. What is that? Some kind of body armor. He's human after all. Before the movie, Batman's costume had usually been depicted as being, well, a costume, meant to frighten criminals more than to protect the person wearing it. The filmmakers apparently assumed that an audience could accept rocket cars and killer clowns, but believing that someone could fight crime without ever taking a bullet to the chest was a little tough to believe. That sparked a trend in superhero movies towards going to great lengths to give a functional justification for why the superheroes were wearing those costumes. It's easy to draw a direct line from Batman's body armor to the way the X-Men talked about their leather suits in the year 2000. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? And all the way through the conversation in 2017's Justice League about how the Flash's costume was made from space shuttle parts. If there's one thing superhero movies love, it's an origin story. And Batman 89 is no exception. In fact, it doesn't just stop with one origin, it gives us two. Not only are we treated to the first of many times that we'll see the Wayne family's ill-fated trip down Crime Alley on the big screen, but most of the plot revolves around another fateful story about who a character is and how they came to be. The Joker. Terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. Unlike the comics where his identity has always been shrouded in mystery to the point of having conflicting origins, the movie gave us the straightforward story of Jack Napier, whose nearly unforgivable pun name and lucky deck of cards led him to take the identity of the Joker. It seems like an odd choice, if only because there's no real change to the character after he takes his ill-fated acid bath. He's already a killer with a thing for playing cards and a wardrobe full of purple suits. His emergence as the Joker just makes his crimes a little more artistic. Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. Batman 89's most crucial plot change was making Jack Napier the crook who shot Batman's parents. That's never been a part of the comics, where the Waynes were shot by a mugger named Joe Chill, as we would eventually see in Batman Begins. The intent here was to give Batman a personal connection to his archenemy that would go beyond just criminal versus crime fighter, which brought the superheroic story more in line with a traditional action movie. 
You killed my parents. What? Oh. <laughs> what are you talking about? I made you. You made me first. That set the tone for virtually every superhero movie that came after, with personal connections built into heroes and villains, even when they never existed in the comics. In Iron Man, for instance, Obadiah Stane wasn't just the rival businessman that readers knew from the comics, he was a father figure for Tony Stark who betrayed him. Along the same lines, the Eric Killmonger scene in the Black Panther movie has a familial tie to T'Challa that his comic book counterpart never did. Hey, auntie. That's not limited to superheroes either. This idea had an effect on the Joker. While Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight retained the character's mysterious, often conflicting origins, the upcoming Joker solo film is doing the exact opposite. It's even set to include both Thomas and Bruce Wayne as characters, giving Joaquin Phoenix as Joker the same sort of personal connection to Batman that we saw in 1989. In the comics, Batman has traditionally been depicted as a character who doesn't kill his enemies if only because it's pretty tough for the Riddler to show up again for his next story if Batman kicks his head off in this one. In the movie, however, he racks up a body count that doesn't just rival the Jokers, it goes well beyond it. He shoots at his opponents with vehicle-mounted machine guns, blows up a factory full of goons with Batmobile bombs tosses a dude to his death from a bell tower, and in the end, has a pretty direct hand in killing the Joker as revenge for the Joker murdering his parents. That idea of treating superhero stories like action movies, where the ending always comes with the death of the bad guy, didn't necessarily start with Batman. Nine years earlier, Superman 2 ended with a Man of Steel tossing the Phantom Zone criminals down a bottomless pit in the Fortress of Solitude. Still, Batman codified it, setting up a pattern of supervillains dying at the end of movies, often at the hands of the good guys, that wouldn't really be subverted until Spider-Man Homecoming, where the villain whose life gets spared at the end is played by… Michael Keaton. When you think of Gotham City, the image that comes to mind is a sprawling, smoke-filled urban nightmare. It's a place with deep shadows and gargoyles leering down from every building, where clean Art Deco designs are shoved right up against buildings that might as well be modern Gothic castles. It's a city that seems built for a character like Batman, and that's an idea that pretty much starts with this movie. Gotham City has, of course, always had its share of character, but it was mostly meant to be relatively realistic. As longtime Batman writer and editor Denny O'Neill put it, Gotham was Manhattan below 14th Street at 11 minutes past midnight on the coldest night in November. All of that changed with the film. Tim Burton's greatest strength has always been his distinctive visuals, and he and production designer Anton Furst put that on display in Batman 89. They recreated Gotham as an environment that was less like the New York you could actually visit and more like, as Burton memorably described it, a city where hell burst through the pavement and grew. The aesthetic stuck too. First designs were quickly incorporated into the comics canon in 1990, and Gotham has retained that distinctly hellish character ever since. In 1978, Superman the movie brought the Man of Steel to our world. In 1989, Burton and First took us to Batman City instead. In a lot of ways, Batman 89 was far more inspired by the 60s TV show than the comics of the 80s, with its brightly colored knockout gas, Dutch angles, and over-the-top villains. These are all the elements that harken back to Adam West's tenure as the caped crusader, which makes a lot of sense, as much of the late 80s brought in groundbreaking comics like The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, Decades of syndication had cemented the show as the most prominent version of the character in the larger pop culture. Burton did, however, draw influence from further back in Batman's history. In an effort to evoke the character's roots, the style of the movie is largely inspired by the fashions and aesthetics of the 1940s. It's clearly set in the modern day. There are computers, modern cars, and, you know, prints. But characters like Jack Napier and Alex Knox wear distinctly 40s-style suits, complete with hats. Even Harvey Dent's campaign for district attorney is a visual reference to Citizen Kane. The overall effect is that the movie's visuals are a very interesting blend of Batman's past and present, but in retrospect, it also serves as a sort of proof of concept for the superhero movie as a period piece. It would take years for this to really pay off, but it's hard to imagine a world where we go to movies like Captain America, The First Avenger, or X-Men First Class without Batman paving the way for superheroes with a retro aesthetic. Imagine that you're the head of a movie studio in July of 1989. Batman is everywhere. And you've watched while it took 10 days to become the fastest movie to ever rack up $100 million at the box office. 
You want another piece of that massive success. Obviously, the best thing to do here is to make more superhero movies and capitalize on the characters that the public already loves, right? You are my number one guy. Wrong. If you're making movies in 1989, you apparently look at the two highest grossing movies of the year, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Batman, and decide that moviegoers are just into movies about stuff that was popular in the 30s and 40s. The years after Batman's titanic success saw a sudden flood of movies that attempted to capitalize on what studios clearly hoped was a trend. Dick Tracy in 1990, The Shadow in 1994, and The Phantom in 1996 were all revivals of characters who had been hugely popular five decades earlier that leaned into their pulpy aesthetics. The Rocketeer in 1991 and The Mask in 1994 were both based on newer comics that had been created in the 80s, but that were brought to the screen with the same kind of retro 40s visuals. It even extended to TV where Darkwing Duck, secret identity Drake Mallard, hit airwaves in 1991 as a full-on parody of The Shadow, secret identity Kent Allard, and a character with whom its target audience had zero familiarity. Unfortunately for the studio executives who really wanted audiences to love The Phantom like they did when they were eight, this was a false start of a trend to jump on. While there were some good movies in that throwback crop, none were as memorable, beloved, or even remotely as successful as Batman. It turned out that the public was far less interested in characters who hit their pop cultural peak 50 years ago than they were in actual superhero stories. And it would take another decade or two for movie studios to come around to that one. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite comic book movies are coming soon! Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one!